This is Papa Alpha. <laughs> Dit is Papa Alpha 0 Echo Tingo Echo voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate voor vandaag 28 februari 2016. Nou, ik laat het er maar in staan. Hè. Dit is het bulletin van zondag. Today's show will be in English. At the end of the show we most probably will have an SSTV image and are of course uh, our Morse code words. Only on Sunday after the show I will want to do some testing on 60 meters. So if there are any amateurs with a receiver for this, uh, this would be very welcome. Uh, I will start transmitting in CW in the last minute of the bulletin around 53.95 kHz, 53.95 plus or minus QRM under the call sign Papa Alpha 6 Echo. Right now we will start with some DX news and after that episode 6 of our sequel on cryptography. November 3, X-ray Oscar Yankee Foxtrot slash 6Y5, I hope I got the call sign right, and Kilo Bravo 3, Bravo Romeo Romeo slash 6 Yankee 6 are active from Jamaica until March 1st, they are operating on the HF bands. Several homes from Italy and Japan are active from Ile de Los, Luz Islands, IOTA, Alpha Foxtrot 051, Guinea until March 4th as 3 X-ray Yankee 1 Tango. They will be operating 160 to 6 meters CW, SSB and RITI. Alpha Hotel 6 Oscar Yankee will be active from Magura Atoll, IOTA OC 029, Marshall Islands March 1st until 7 as Victor 73 uh, India. Call sign is not confirmed. He will be operating on HF bands including activity in the ARRL DX SSB contest. Kilo 2 November Golf, November Alpha 2 Alpha Alpha and November 2 Bravo Alpha will be active from Bonaire Island as Papa Juliet 4 Golf in the ARRL DX SSB contest 5 and 6 March uh, 2016. They will be in the Mike slash 2 category. Operators will be individually signing Papa Juliet 4 slash home call sign before and after the contest. Lima Uniform 9 Echo Foxtrot Oscar will be active from Ascension Island, Guaiticas Archipelago, Iota Sierra Alpha 043, 18 to 22 March as X-ray Romeo 7 Lima Uniform. He will be operating on HF bands. Foxtrot 6 Bravo Golf Charlie will be active from Maldives Islands, IOTA AS013, March 12 until 22 as 8 Quebec 7 November Charlie. This time he will be QRV from Tulha Giri Island. He will be active from 80 to 6 meters. Armed with this information, they built this machine to break Japanese purple ciphers. It remains 50 years later, under guard, in a secret government warehouse in Maryland. It consists basically of two electric typewriters. Into one was typed the Japanese enciphered message. The electrical impulse is then passed through a 26-position plug board, which had to be reset every day, and through an electrical maze created by the rapid movements of the stepping relays. The Japanese plain text ready for translation appeared on the second typewriter. Amazingly, Friedman's team recreated this machine simply by analyzing the intercepted messages. In August 1940, Rowlett and the engineer Leo Rosen had the machine ready. I was working with Rosen. This was about 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night because we wanted to finish this thing. We'd waited so long for it. We just couldn't wait any longer. And uh, so I got a message. And we set up the machine to the indicator and... Um, I started typing, and the first few groups, the first three or four that I typed in the machine came out beautifully on the other end. The Japanese plain text that we knew, because we'd solved the message by hand earlier, uh, had to come out. And then all of a sudden the machine stopped operating. And uh, after a little puzzle about it, uh, Rosen concluded that uh, uh, we had failed to put in uh, relay that was needed uh, a, a, a condenser uh, over the relay points that was needed for the master relay and so we got hold of one of those and he installed it and lo and behold it worked just like a charm from then on so we were ready to demonstrate it to the chief signal officer next morning and also to Friedman and General Aiken 
and the others who were in the chain of camp command that were interested in what we were doing. And what was their reaction? Amazement and uh, great pleasure. William Friedman's achievement has been shrouded in secrecy. Only now is his full contribution being recognized. He was probably the most brilliant cryptanalyst we've ever seen. He engendered theoretical ideas which took cryptography out of its kind of primitive land into the new world of statistical analysis in a very sophisticated way. He led and organized and directed and inspired the team that using some of his techniques cracked the Japanese purple cipher machine, which was quite possibly the greatest feat of cryptanalysis the world had ever seen. The breaking of purple allowed American intelligence to read all top-grade Japanese government traffic, including messages between Tokyo and Japanese embassies around the world. The Japanese ambassador in Berlin, Baron Oshima, was a close friend of Hitler, and he became an unwitting spy at Hitler's dinner table, when all of his reports to Tokyo in the purple cipher were also read in Washington and passed on to London. As 1941 came to a close, top U.S. officials had a constant flow of secret information. But though they gained much vital intelligence, the codebreakers still had not penetrated another vital Japanese code called JN-25. Washingtonese preparations for war, but did not know that the Japanese fleet had already put to sea. The White House learned the Japanese embassy was burning documents. On the night of December 6, 1941, intercept stations picked up heavy Japanese radio traffic from Tokyo to their embassy in Washington. The machines clattered with the intercepted purple code groups. The tapes were rushed to the code breakers on Constitution Avenue where the ciphers were decrypted. The text was then teletyped to the State Department. It ordered the Japanese ambassador to break off diplomatic relations at precisely 1 p.m. Washington time when the sun was just rising over the Hawaiian Islands. Hickam Field, Pearl Harbor. Boeing B-17 fortresses are lined up wingtip to wingtip. On battleship row are seven battleships. The first bomb exploded at 7.55 a.m. with the battleships as the principal targets. In two hours, it was all over. 3,500 lay dead or wounded, and seven battleships were reported lost. Could the attack have been anticipated? Should President Roosevelt have known about it in advance? When, when I am asked the question about uh, Roosevelt's having advance information, I ask where could it have come from? And uh, the offer is made that it came from the British, that the British were breaking the Japanese codes and had the information gave it to Churchill, and Churchill gave it to Roosevelt. We go back to the first stage of that uh, premise, and that is that Japan was sending out messages that indicated they were going to attack Pearl Harbor. And my question is, to whom would they be sending such messages? There was no one on God's green earth they should be sending such messages. Now, we have, since the war, gone back and reviewed the messages, uh, the Japanese uh, JN-25 series messages that were intercepted prior to Pearl Harbor. And there are some uh, 10,000 of those messages that were intercepted between 1 September and 7 December 1941. Uh, they were reviewed after the war, and uh, some 12 or 1,300 of the messages were thought um, important enough to translate. And they were translated by my colleagues who were waiting to accumulate enough retirement points to get out of the Navy and get back to what they wanted to do in the first place. And so they were set to work do doing these 1,200 messages. They're all down in the archives. And if you go through those messages knowing about the attack on Pearl Harbor, you can see things that suggest there was going to be an attack. And if you know, as we now know, that the target was Pearl Harbor, you can easily read into those messages that it was exclusively Pearl Harbor.
Plopper. Ja, ik laat het er maar in staan, hè. This is Papa Alpha. <laughs> so far, sequel on Crit Topic. And after that, episode 6 are... And after that, episode... And after that, episode 6 of our sequel on cryptography. And after that, episode 6 of our sequel on crypt. And after that, and after that, episode 6 of our sequel on cryptography.